Got it. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining International Bipolar Foundation's webinar today with Dr. Suzanne Goh. Dr. Goh graduated from Harvard College and was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship to pursue graduate studies at Oxford University. She attended Harvard Medical School and completed her residency <laughs> training in pediatrics and neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital and UC San Francisco. She then joined Columbia University, where she served as co-director of the Developmental Neuropsychiatry Clinic. She oversaw a multidisciplinary team of physicians and psychologists working to provide the best medical and behavioral treatment to children and adults with neuropsychiatric disorders. She currently has a private practice in San Diego, California. Today, Dr. Goh will look at some of the new findings in the neurobiology and psychiatric illness and how novel interventions aimed at altering brain chemistry can have a positive in impact. We're very pleased to have you today, Dr. Goh. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to, to join you. Um, I'd like to, to start out, um, we'll be discussing a lot uh, related to neurobiology and neurochemistry today. But I, I wanted to start out by, um, let's see, by making a couple of main points. And one is that um, conditions that in the past have been called psychiatric, in fact, are all neuropsychiatric. And neuro means that um, these conditions involve changes to the brain on many levels such as brain wiring, brain biochemistry, brain electrical activity. And the psychiatric part means that they manifest as certain types of symptoms. For example, how one thinks, behaves, uh, perceives, and reacts to the world. So in, in the past, there's been a bias in the field of medicine where the label of neurological was assigned to a condition if certain types of symptoms were more prominent, such as a loss of movement, like you might see in some forms of stroke. And then the label of psychiatric was assigned when symptoms were of another type, affecting mood, perception, or behavior. But the fact is that they're all located in the brain, and we're really beginning to understand much more about their neurological and biochemical basis. So the, the implication of this is a really exciting one, which is that it opens up a lot of new ways to think about treatment and a, a form of really comprehensive treatment that aims to shift brain's biochemical and electrical activity. Now, another important point I'd like to make right at the start today is that the brain is not static. It undergoes dramatic changes from the time of conception and throughout our lifetime. And here on the left, you see a stunning image of an eight-week-old fetus in the womb. And on the right is a mature adult brain. Many of the symptoms that we associate with neuropsychiatric disorders are a result of disturbance to brain development. And even a disorder that doesn't show up until adulthood or is not diagnosed in adulthood is often due to something that was disturbed in the process of brain development in childhood. And many childhood brain disorders do give rise to what we think of as psychiatric symptoms, either in childhood or later in life. And I also feel very strongly that brain development has been thought of in too narrow a way as something that happens only during childhood. And in fact, the brain is highly plastic and continuously changing and evolving throughout life. And um, so brain development, in my view, should be something that's viewed as happening from the moment of conception and throughout our lifetime. Now, um, I wanted to give you a couple of definitions for terms that I'll be using very frequently today. The first is metabolism. And that's a term we hear a lot, but it actually has a very precise definition, and that is the process by which the body converts nutrients into energy. And the term biochemistry means the chemical composition of a particular living system. So this diagram, which you'll see is very complex and far too detailed for you to, uh, to see the actual words, but what this diagram represents is the metabolic biochemical pathways in the body. And um, this you know, can be captured as a snapshot in a diagram like this, but it is actually an enormously complex and dynamic process that's ever-changing and really um, has a profound impact on 
our body's function, how we feel, how we think, um, and as I'll discuss more, is, is impacted by important factors like um, what we consume, um, what we experience, and, um, and so forth. You might be familiar with a bra this book um, called Brain on Fire, which is written by Susanna Cahalan, who is a, a reporter at the New York Post. Um, this book is a New York Times bestseller and, a, in my view, a really, really important book in um, showing how conditions that we in the past have thought of as being psychiatric um, have a very clear and very identifiable molecular and biochemical basis and that it, it takes us in directions of treatment that are really important. Um, I think this book is a, is a great resource and something that um, may help to educate physicians and so I would encourage you to, to read it if you haven't already and also um, if you have a physician who you're working with who's um, open and, and curious about the neuroscience basis um, to psychiatric conditions, you may want to share this with them as well. Now, I'd like to move on and discuss very briefly two cases that have been published in the research literature. And um, the cases provide some examples of individuals who have been diagnosed with psychiatric disorders and then were later found to have an underlying metabolic cause. So the first case is of a 63-year-old woman who had a primary uh, complaint of fatigue and she was diagnosed by several physicians as having fibromyalgia and major depressive disorder. Um, in her past medical history, she'd had many episodes of depressed mood, insomnia, um, anhedonia, which is a loss of interest, um, suicidal ideation, meaning thoughts of suicide, uh, and these symptoms recurred at ages 12, 33, and 40 years. And for this, she was treated with a medication called an SSRI, which is a form of antidepressant. It stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. In her family history, um, there were individuals who had diagnoses of major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, and um, several maternal relatives, so relatives on her mother's side of the family, had had psychiatric hospitalizations. Her neurological exam was normal, but she did have a slightly abnormal uh, blood test for a, a compound called lactate, and I'll be talking more about the significance of lactate later on. Um, the finding of the elevated lactate level in her blood prompted a neurologist to do a muscle biopsy. And that's a procedure where they take a small piece of muscle tissue and um, uh, do some, uh, you know, chemical, they do some steps to the tissue to stain it. And what they found was um, what they call ragged red fibers. And that's where there's an abnormal appearance to the mitochondria in muscle tissue and that led to um, the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. Uh, and we'll talk much more about mitochondria and what uh, mitochondrial disease is and potential treatments for it. So in her case, they were able to identify a very clear metabolic um, disorder that was the cause of her psychiatric symptoms. Now the second case is of a 29-year-old woman who in the past had been diagnosed with dysthymic disorder, borderline personality disorder, had had prior suicide attempts, and had also had um, events that were thought to potentially be seizure, but when further testing and um, EEG testing was done, they were eventually diagnosed as being non-epileptic seizures, meaning they were events that were of psychogenic origin or felt to be psychological. She also had a diagnosis of complicated migraine, where she would experience headache, vomiting, and confusion. So as a treatment for her migraine headaches, she was started on a medication called valproic acid. A valproic acid is also commonly used in the treatment of bipolar disorder um, and, and mood disorders. Um, she eventually was diagnosed uh, with a defect of mitochondrial beta oxidation which is a form of mitochondrial disorder. And they arrived at that diagnosis only because um, upon taking valproic acid, she became comatose. And that is because valproic acid can have toxic effects on mitochondria. So um, what I hope these cases show you is that 
um, it's well known in the scientific literature that individuals who are diagnosed with psychiatric disorders can later be found to have a metabolic cause. And um, how often this happens, we really don't know because, um, you know, typically uh, these sorts of conditions aren't tested for. And um, another important reason is that our tests are imperfect. And even though they are improving um, over time, uh, our ability to, to accurately and quickly identify metabolic and biochemical disturbances is still um, quite limited. Sometimes it requires repeated testing and sometimes it requires testing under certain conditions like um, illness or, or fasting. So um, I want to move on and, and present to you what I consider to be my treatment model for neuropsychiatric disorders. And it, it looks like this where um, it really recognizes that um, the biochemical environment of the brain influences behavior cognition and emotion, um, and the social environment does as well. Um, but what hasn't really been recognized is that the way the social environment impacts the brain is actually by changing the brain's biochemistry. So um, this is, I think, an important and, and, and new way of, of thinking about how um, social experiences in the world around us impacts um, brain biochemistry and ultimately um, the symptoms that we may experience in um, cognition behavior. And um, this slide is meant to illustrate a pretty simple point, um, which is that the brain is very intimately connected to the rest of the body. There is a portion of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And it is um, how the brain is connected to the internal organs. So you can see in this diagram, um, it's connected to the, to the eyes, to the um, endocrine glands like the thyroid and the adrenal glands, connected to the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the entire gastrointestinal tract, um, the kidneys, uh, liver, and so forth. And that is, um, this component of the nervous system is remarkable in the fact that it is what allows um, our sensory perceptions through vision, um, taste, uh, sound, touch, to immediately to be perceived by the brain and then to immediately affect the function of our internal organs. So um, an experience might uh, lead to the heart pumping faster, um, to the diaphragm and the lungs breathing faster or slower, to the GI tract becoming um, more active or less active. Um, so the way that our um, environment impacts the full body's uh, physiology is very rapid and, and profound. And through another system, um, the neuroendocrine system, this is another means by which the brain really rapidly affects um, the physiology and the rest of the body. And um, there's a, a part of the brain that um, secretes many different hormones and those hormones then go on to act um, throughout the body on different organ systems. Um, I also want to mention that um, there has long been known to be um, a phenomenon uh, that we term most commonly seizure activity um, and that now we're beginning to understand that there are many, many more subtle forms of uh, seizure activity or abnormal brain electrical activity. Now seizures um, are events that often manifest as periods of unusual behavior, movement, or reduced awareness that seem involuntary. And these are accompanied by abnormal findings on EEG. Now EEG is a study where electrodes are placed on the scalp and the electrical activity in, in the brain can then be read by machine. Um, we know that this type of abnormal brain electrical activity um, can lead to a loss of developmental skills, uh, can lead to uh, intellectual disability and to symptoms of autism and many other neuropsychiatric symptoms. And we also know that actually more subtle abnormalities of electrical activity, especially if they're located deep in the brain, may not be detected by scalp electrodes on an EEG. 
So there's a, a full spectrum of ways that abnormal brain electrical activity can lead to change in behavior, cognition, and mood. And our tests for um, detecting that electrical activity are, um, are, are imperfect and not highly sensitive. Um, this diagram illustrates for you the tremendous variation of what, what we see as forms of seizure. And I just want to draw your attention to um, this part of the diagram because it shows you that we know very clearly that when certain parts of the brain have abnormal electrical activity, it can manifest as what we consider to be psychic symptoms, meaning things like um, uh, mood disturbance or fear, uh, illusions, so seeing things that aren't really there, or hallucinations, um, you know, hearing and seeing things that aren't present. Um, it can also lead to a range of different cognitive symptoms, problems with memory or executive function and, and so forth. So, you know, having discussed some of these um, different electrical and um, endocrine and sort of autonomic nervous system phenomenon, um, I want to now go a little bit deeper into a very particular aspect of metabolism that has to do with a component of cells, a tiny organelle inside of cells called mitochondria. And um, this is a fairly complex area of study, so um, I want to start with something more intuitive, which is the full body. And you can see that depicted in the diagram here. The human body, um, as you know, is composed of many systems and organs, you know, the brain, lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, um, gastrointestinal tract, uh, bones, muscles. But um, within those organs um, are cells. So the body of an adult has close to 100 trillion cells. And on the left here, you can see a diagram showing a microscopic image of an actual human cell. And on the right is a schematic, a drawing that shows you the inside of the cell and how there are many um, structures, tiny subcellular structures within cells. Now looking more closely inside the cell, um, you can see here, circled in red, um, cellular organelles called the mitochondria. Um, the mitochondria, also shown in this diagram, are often referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. Um, they generate energy in the form of a compound called ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. Um, this function of mitochondria is essential for human life. So mitochondria provide the vast majority of energy that we need for all of the body's functions. Um, the density of mitochondria varies from tissue to tissue depending on its energy requirement. So there are some organs in the body like the brain and muscle that have very high energy demands and so the density of mitochondria in those um, tissues is very high. Now um, I want to show you here a couple of images of the brain. Um, so, you know, we, we've thought about mitochondria, which are microscopic, um, which are located in every organ in the body um, and produce energy. When we look at an image like this, which is a brain MRI, um, obviously we can't see mitochondria. What we can see is, is a relatively gross image of some structures within the brain. Um, on the left is a slice through the brain called an axial slice. So it's sort of, it's a cross-sectional slice um, horizontally. So at the top of the screen is the person's forehead and the bottom of the screen is the back of their head. So this gives you one slice, you know, one way of looking at the brain. On the right is an image of the brain taken through another slice, um, uh, which we might consider, you know, a vertical slice. It's also called a sagittal slice. And here you can see <clears throat> to the left is the profile, so you can see the, the individual's nose and mouth, and you can see to the right is the back of their head. So these are just examples of different ways that we have of looking at the, at the brain. But um, these, the resolution, um, though, uh, is, is not um, at the mi level of, of a microscopic level. So it is a little bit like looking at a TV screen, you know, where you can see the image, but the image is made of, of tiny pixels and, um, and that, that we can't see. So there are some limitations to how our clinical tests 
um, are able to see what's really happening inside the brain. And that becomes really important when we think about individuals who have psychiatric diseases who are um, told that they have a brain, normal brain MRI and therefore there could not be a neurological um, process going on. Um, the, the normal brain MRI um, does not exclude um, biochemical and molecular changes and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to show you now just a couple of examples of brain MRIs where you can in fact see changes um, and what those changes mean. So this first condition is one called tuberous sclerosis complex and it's a disorder caused by a mutation in, um, in a gene and you'll see that there's a difference in how the brain appears on MRI scan, that there are many areas where the brain tissue appears more white when compared to the normal, uh, to the normal MRI. And those are areas of the brain where during fetal life, the neurons, which are the cells of the brain, did not migrate, did not move to the correct place. They became stuck in the wrong location in the brain. And um, so those areas of the brain are very susceptible to causing seizures um, on postmortem autopsy, they have a very firm, hard feel to them and um, were once described as being like potatoes, which gave rise to the name tuberous sclerosis um, after tubers, which the, um, the early scientists um, describe, used that term to describe the brain. Um, so individuals who have tuberous sclerosis complex have a very wide range of neuropsychiatric um, symptoms, including intellectual disability, autism. Um, and many other uh, mood disorders and cognitive disorders. This MRI on the right shows a condition called agenesis of the corpus callosum. And it's a condition where during fetal life, the brain has not formed um, the large uh, structure called the corpus callosum that connects the left and right sides of the hemisphere, of the left and right sides of the brain. So you can see right in the middle of the brain, there's a, a big structure that's present there on the left that looks like a, it's sort of like a horseshoe, uh, and on the right it's absent. And individuals who have this um, also have uh, high rates of intellectual disability, autism, and various other cognitive um, learning and mood uh, disorders. Now, um, what I'm showing you here is, is um, an image of a normal brain MRI scan and then one of an individual with autism. And um, this is just to illustrate uh, the, the point that for the vast majority of those with a diagnosis of autism, uh, this is also true for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and many other neuropsychiatric disorders, is that the brain MRI scan is normal. So um, this is, is a really important uh, point to make because um, the problem leading to these symptoms is at a microscopic level that just can't be seen on an image of this resolution. But what we do see over time um, is that changes often do develop. And so on the right is a brain MRI scan of an older adult with autism. And you can see that um, there has been a loss of brain tissue. So the parts of the brain in the center, which are called the ventricles, which hold the fluid inside the brain, those look much larger. And that's not because fluid has increased, it's because um, brain tissue has decreased and fluid has moved in to fill that space. And the reason for this, um, there are a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the brain is a lot like muscle tissue in the sense that if it's not used, it will tend to be lost over time, and that's a condition called atrophy. And that often happens with uh, certain neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, but also because something is uh, happening at the microscopic level to damage and to lead to a loss of brain tissue. And there's more and more research evidence now showing that that process has to do with metabolism and mitochondria. Um, this is a paper that uh, I published with a group of colleagues at Columbia University uh, last year. It was published in the journal JAMA Psychiatry. And um, what we were able to identify was um, areas of the brain in children and adults with autism that had impaired mitochondrial function. So parts of the brain where energy production by mitochondria was not functioning um, in an optimal way. And um, we were also able to map out which parts of the brain um, seemed to be most affected. 
and it was areas of the brain um, that are very important for things like language processing and communication, for the integration of higher order thought, um, emotion, and behavior. Um, and in particular, uh, this one part of the brain that you can see in the image in the lower right corner, um, that's the part of the brain that's highlighted there in red, that part of the brain is called the cingulate gyrus. And it's extremely important for um, many of the functions that we associate with um, mood, social awareness, cognition, and behavior. And so what we feel we've identified is a part of the brain that seems to be impaired um, metabolically and which um, there then uh, accounts for many of the symptoms that we associate with autism spectrum disorder. Um, this is a research paper that was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And um, it was published by a group of researchers at the University of California, Davis. And what they were able to show was that 80% of children with autism had uh, reduced activity of a particular component of the mitochondria, which is called the mitochondrial respiratory chain complex one. This was a really groundbreaking um, article in the study of autism um, because uh, it was able to identify a clear metabolic biochemical um, deficiency that likely contributes to the symptoms of the, the disorder. Now, um, I'm going to talk, show you a few more examples from um, the field of autism because that's a specialty and, a, and an area of focus for me. Um, and then I'll move on to talk um, about some of the recent research in bipolar disorder. Um, this is a, a review article that was published in the journal Lancet Neurology which is a very um, prominent and highly regarded journal in uh, Britain. And what these researchers um, discussed is how um, in the past decade, many of the industrial chemicals and pesticides that are used very widely in our environment um, have now been shown through very rigorous research studies to be toxic and to have um, damaging effects on brain development. Most of the um, industrial chemicals that are used uh, very widely are, are used um, after they've been tested for safety on adult rats, adult and adult mice. And so their effects on the developing brain in humans has just really been unknown. Now the research is starting to catch up and so um, there's a lot of evidence now for um, ways that pesticides and, and chemicals in our environment that we've produced are likely having a, a harmful effect on brain development in children. Um, if we think, you know, back to this this diagram showing um, the metabolic pathways in the body, um, one of the most powerful ways that we have to impact this complex system is through dietary modifications. Um, another way is through nutritional supplementation. And another is through exercise and lifestyle changes, such as sunlight exposure and, as I mentioned earlier, avoiding toxins in the environment. When dealing with such a complex system, um, changes like diet and exercise, which have many different biological effects, tend to be uh, quite efficacious, um, more so than uh, something uh, very limited, such as a single medication or even a, a single uh, nutritional supplement. Now, in the in the field of autism, um, more and more research is now coming out looking at how certain um, supplements and and uh, vitamins that can aid um, in met metabolism and in the function of mitochondria um, might uh, improve the core symptoms of autism. So this is a recent study published in a very prominent journal called The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And in this study, um, which was conducted uh, by researchers at John Hop Johns Hopkins University and, and Harvard Medical School, they found that a compound called sulforaphane, which is also known as broccoli seed extract, was effective in treating many of the symptoms of autism. Sulforaphane is a very potent antioxidant. Um, and one of the um, benefits of antioxidants is that it can help, um, it has helpful effects on the function of mitochondria. Now, um, 
there are some practice guidelines that have been uh, published by leading researchers and physicians at academic universities, and I just wanted to show you this one, which was published by Johns Hopkins University's Kennedy Krieger Institute, um, their division of metabolism. And this pertains to the treatment of mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial disease in patients with autism. And what they state very clearly is that in their experience of treating, uh, diagnosing and treating mitochondrial dysfunction in those with autism for over 15 years, that they've seen consistent improvement and in some cases reversal of symptoms with the use of certain vitamins and supplements. Um, this is a quote taken directly from their practice guideline. Our clinical experience at Kennedy Krieger Institute over the last 15 years has shown that a deficiency of mitochondrial complex one is a common cause of regressive autism. While permanent developmental losses can be substantial, recovery can be almost complete in some children when treatment is started early, after the first episode of regression, and partial response to metabolic therapy remains possible indefinitely. So um, this is the protocol, the treatment protocol that they use and they recommend for, for those with a diagnosis of autism and mitochondrial dysfunction. It includes um, several uh, vitamins and supplements such as L-carnitine, coenzyme Q10, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin B5, and alpha lipoic acid. And um, because of the difficulty of administering such high dosages of uh, multiple different supplements and vitamins, um, I worked with uh, the parent of one of my patients and we created a nutritional supplement called Mitospectra, which was really targeted at improving um, the component of uh, the aspect of mitochondrial function, which is very commonly impaired in neuropsychiatric conditions, including autism. And it's based on the practice guideline here um, published by Johns Hopkins University. Now, um, Here's a more comprehensive list of vitamins and supplements that are very frequently used in the treatment of mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, L-carnitine, CoQ10, vitamin C and E, a whole range of different B-complex vitamins, L-creatine, alpha-lipoic acid, and L-arginine. And I'll just say another word about um, optimizing diet and lifestyle because this is such an important factor in treatment. So, when there is a metabolic disturbance, especially if it relates to mitochondria, it's helpful to limit periods of fasting, uh, to increase meal frequency, and to improve hydration. Uh, important also to avoid mitochondrial toxins like certain medications, certain antibiotics, and certain uh, chemicals in the environment. Um, also important to avoid unnecessary physiological stressors such as illness, dehydration, fever, temperature extremes, surgery, anesthesia, prolonged fasting or starvation, and especially any of these in combination. Now it may not always be possible to avoid these, but to keep them in mind and when possible to avoid um, multiple stressors at one time. Um, to provide supportive care during conditions of physiologic stress, so to provide adequate hydration and nutrition and certain nutritional uh, supplements or vitamins. And finally, consistent moderate exercise. And that can't be emphasized enough because um, exercise is the most natural way we have to enhance mitochondrial function. And it does that because with exercise, um, every time the, the, the body is um, in a state of uh, uh, vigorous physical activity and, and exercise, it places a degree of stress on the body that the body then learns to recover from. And it's that process of recovery that then trains the, the system um, into a more optimal state. So um, I want to take some time now um, to talk about bipolar disorder and some of the emerging research in this area. Um, it's newer and um, has not been quite as well studied for bipolar disorder as it has been for conditions such as autism but the findings are very similar, overlap in many ways, and I wanted to make sure that um, you were aware of this particular uh, research article. It's a review paper that was published by researchers at um, Massachusetts General Hospital, which is one of the teaching hospitals of Harvard Medical School. And um, I, because I think this is such an important resource for you, I've uh, 
it is it's open access, so it's open to the public. Um, and I've put a copy of this paper on my website, and I'll provide the link to you at the very end of this presentation, so you can go and download this full article. Um, I think it can be very helpful for you to read through it, and potentially also to take this to your um, your physicians and use this as a tool that can help to educate them. So um, I'm going to talk to you now about um, some of the things that are discussed uh, more specifically in this research paper. So um, one of the important uh, points made in this paper is that mitochondria in those with bipolar disorder seem to have difficulty adapting to energy stress. Now, there was uh, a study published in 2007 um, that showed that there was no difference between bipolar patients and control patients in the expression of genes uh, called electron transport chain genes, which are important in mitochondrial function, when um, the individuals were under conditions of normal glucose concentrations. Okay, so what that means is when they looked at individuals with bipolar disorder, and individuals without bipolar disorder who were under normal conditions of um, uh, normal blood sugar. They found that there was really no difference in the way that their bodies expressed genes uh, important for mitochondrial function. But when the cells, the white blood cells of these individuals were exposed to glucose deprivation, so low levels of blood sugar, the individuals with bipolar disorder showed a reduced expression of mitochondrial genes. So how these researchers have interpreted this find, these findings is that when there is some sort of physiological stress such as low blood sugar, those with bipolar disorder seem less able to compensate for it in the function of their mitochondria. So that it may be um, that it takes some sort of physiological stress in order to um, reveal or sort of um, show this vulnerability that exists in how their mitochondria are able to compensate and to function. Um, another point made by these the researchers in this review article is that in those with bipolar disorder, there are several findings that suggest um, impaired mitochondrial function directly in the brain. Um, one of them is increased levels of lactate, which is a very similar finding to the one that we um, found in our study of individuals with autism. Um, they also found lower intracellular pH levels. So pH is a measure of the acid-base balance, and they found that there was a more acidic um, pH level inside cells in those with um, bipolar disorders, which points to a possible uh, dysfunction of the mitochondria. Another finding was a reduction in a compound called N-acetyl aspartate in the brain, and that is also felt to be a marker of um, abnormal uh, metabolism in the brain. So um, there have now been a few uh, very good review papers um, looking at possible mitochondrial therapies for bipolar disorder. And so I'll run through um, some of those uh, potential therapies now. You see the list shown here. Um, the first is a compound called N-acetylcysteine which is often abbreviated NAC. And um, what this compound does is to increase synthesis of a, another compound called glutathione, which is a very potent antioxidant um, and important in the liver's ability to, um, to detoxify. Another compound is acetyl-L-carnitine. Um, L-carnitine is important in transporting fatty acids into mitochondria for beta oxidation and energy generation. So L-carnitine is um, an essential uh, compound in actually getting fats in the form of fatty acids into mitochondria where they can then be broken down um, and, uh, and uh, made into energy in the form of ATP. Another potential candidate therapy is called S-adenosylmethionine, which is abbreviated SAMe. Uh, this is a major source of methyl groups for key biochemical reactions. Um, and another is coenzyme Q10, which is abbreviated CoQ10. And this is a component of, mito of the mitochondrial respiratory chain um, and is also a very potent antioxidant. Alpha-lipoic acid, abbreviated ALA, 
is a potent antioxidant and also has uh, important roles in mitochondrial energy production. Creatine monohydrate is a compound that is a precursor to phosphocreatine, which is a donor of phosphate to ADP, which leads to the generation of ATP, which is the fuel's main, uh, the body's main fuel source. And finally, melatonin, which is widely known as a sleep aid, um, but also has very potent antioxidant um, and other biological effects that are beneficial for, um, for mitochondria and metabolism. So um, I know I've covered a, a tremendous amount um, in a short time, but I wanted to uh, give you these links to additional resources on mitochondrial supplements. So the top link is to the review article on mitochondrial therapies for bipolar disorder, which is on my website uh, where you can download it. And the second link is to the company Mitomedical, which I've, I was involved in starting and um, sells a mitochondrial supplement based on the research at Johns Hopkins University. So um, thank you so much for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Go. Again, um, please type in your questions on your control panel and I will be sure to read them to Dr. Go to answer. Um, just give you a couple minutes for questions. Okay, the first question, great question. How do the supplements interact with medication? Yes, so um, one of the really nice uh, features of, uh, of the supplements that are used for mitochondrial function is that um, in general they are extremely well tolerated with very few side effects and very few interactions with medications, uh, with psychotropic medications in particular. So um, it's important that any, any supplements um, that are taken be used under the supervision of, of a physician and that a physician be aware. Um, and there, there are um, some side effects that are associated with very high doses of certain supplements. So I'll give you one example, which is that vitamin B6, which is pyridoxine, um, if taken at very high levels, can actually have neurotoxic effects. So it can actually lead to loss of function in neurons. So um, it's just Im important to be aware of some of those potential side effects. Um, vitamin E, for example, if taken at very high doses, can sometimes lead to thinning of the blood, so it can lead to increased risk for nosebleeds. Um, and for anybody who's on any sort of blood thinning medication, um, high doses of vitamin E um, could potentially be dangerous. So um, it's important to talk with your physician and, and make sure that they're aware of anything that you are taking. Um, there are, um, you know, there are ways to take supplements that can help to reduce their potential for side effects. So, for example, the, the compound L-carnitine, um, if it's started at too high a dose right away, um, it can lead to hyperactivity, especially in children, or a feeling of irrit um, irritability and, and agitation. But that side effect goes away if it started at a lower dose and increased gradually over several weeks up to the desired dose. So um, fortunately, generally these supplements are very safe and um, have very few reported side effects, um, far fewer side effects than the medications that are commonly used um, for neuropsychiatric symptoms, but at the same time they should certainly be used with caution and under the supervision of a doctor. Excellent, thank you. Um, do you have an approximate cost for these supplements? Um, maybe um, your particular? Yes, so um, there's a wide range. Um, among supplements, some of them are more expensive. So for example, coenzyme Q10 can run quite high so that a month's supply may be between one to $200. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is that um, most supplements do need to be dosed based on weight. So that amount, the amount a young child would take is far less than the amount that an adult would take. Um, the, I can tell you, because I've, I'm um, one of the 
uh, founders and advisors to the company Mitomedical that the mitochondrial cocktail they sell um, on average is about $100 to $150 for a full month supply and uh, for an adult and that includes five different um, components. So um, and then uh, you know there are some components of uh, mitochondrial cocktail that are very inexpensive. You know, for example, vitamin C, where uh, you know a month supply could be around ten to fifteen dollars. I, I do want to make one comment in um, when evaluating the safety of different um, brands of nutritional supplements, and that is um, there are certain uh, guidelines that the FDA has established for quality manufacturing. So one set of standards is called Good Manufacturing Practices, which is um, abbreviated GMP, and I would consider that to be a minimum standard that needs to be met um, by a nutritional supplement company. So you want to be careful and look at the packaging and the website to look and, and see if the company states clearly that they meet GMP manufacturing standards. Um, and then a, a level even above that would be if those standards have then been certified by a third party such as NSF or USP. Um, so that's it's important and there, in general the large national um, nutritional supplement companies uh, meet those standards and, and then there are some companies that sell only to physicians so they meet those standards and they um, sell only to physicians to ensure that physicians are monitoring um, and overseeing the use of the supplements in their patients. Those tend to be um, very good companies to go with. Great, thank you. Um, can any of these elements be found in foods? And also, um, can you take some and not the others and still have you know, a, a positive effect? Yes. You can certainly take some and not the others. Often there is a synergistic effect. So some combination of them tends to lead to more benefit um, than taking them individually. But that's, uh, so, so putting together, you know, the combination does take some skill and some time and, um, you know, it does need to be done step by step in a, in a thoughtful way. Um, could you repeat the first part of the question? Sure. Can any of these um, elements be found in food? Yes. So, um, in fact, the vast majority are found in food, and food is the preferred way to get them. It's just that it can be hard to consume enough quantity of food in order to get the high doses that are desired. So, um, there's a wonderful resource online um, published by the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements. So, if you if you Google NIH Dietary Supplements um, and vitamin B12, for example, it'll show you um, what you'll find is um, a really thorough description of the vitamin, its physiological actions, what happens if there's a deficiency of that vitamin, um, what food sources are excellent, um, excellent ways to get that vitamin, and exactly how much of that vitamin is in different food sources. So I always think getting these from food is, um, if, if that's possible, you know, if, if for some children um, their diets are very restricted so it is not possible and there may be food allergies or other limitations. But in general, if, it's, if you can get these from food as your primary source, um, that's the best route to go. Great, thank you. When you mentioned exercise as a way of promoting mitochondrial function, do you recommend a certain level of exercise for your bipolar patients? Yes, um, so the amount of exercise, um, is it, it depends to some degree um, on the individual and their, um, you know, their preferences and also their, um, uh, their own individual physiology. But the amount of exercise that I recommend um, often surprises people because uh, it exceeds um, what most people think of as is how much we should exercise in one day. So um, I think for many individuals, exercising up to two hours a day, so um, an hour, you know, maybe in the morning or an hour in the afternoon or evening, is, um, in my view, likely to be what's optimal. Um, at a minimum, 30 minutes each day, 
um, in order to get some benefit. Um, but it could be you know up to two hours a day, and not every day. But um, using that as a range, somewhere between 30 minutes to two hours each day um, on most days of the week, if not all days, is optimal. And the type of exercise is, um, I would describe as being moderate, meaning that the exertion is um, at a level high enough to to cause sweating, but where you can still comfortably um, maintain a conversation. Um, sweating is one of the, the body's most um, important and powerful ways to get rid of toxins. So um, it's important that we give our bodies that, that opportunity as often as possible. Great, thank you. What markers of the blood test can you test mitochondrial dysfunction? Yes, um, so there's, um, on my website, um, there's also a, a link where you can find the, the practice guideline that was published by um, Johns Hopkins University. And in that practice guideline, even though it's, um, you know, it's discussing autism specifically, it does list within there um, a whole range of different tests done on blood and urine that are markers that can show markers for mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, I'll tell you a few of them. So one of the very classic um, blood biomarkers is lactic acid. And um, when that is elevated, even if it's elevated just slightly, that is a very, um, a very good marker for mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, other tests are uh, plasma amino acids, so looking at uh, dozens of different amino acids and their levels in the blood, um, looking at a, a, a range of different compounds called organic acids in the urine. Um, there can also be signs on liver function tests, so looking at different liver enzymes can be helpful. Um, but there's a more comprehensive list that you can, um, you can access um, on my website. Great, thank you. Would seasonal affective disorder be considered a metabolically based disorder? Um, see, you know, the short answer is um, we don't know for sure, but my view is yes. And um, seasonal affective disorder is in one form of mood disorder. So it manifests in certain ways at certain times of the year. Um, and, uh, and we do know that for some people, sunlight is um, effective in, in ameliorating the symptoms. Um, and sunlight is very much like um, diet and exercise in that it has very profound um, effects on the body's metabolism in lots of different ways, um, one of which is to increase um, the body's um, levels of vitamin D. And vitamin D is important in a lot of different metabolic pathways in the body. So, um, yes, yeah, so so I think seasonal affective disorder should be considered along, you know, the same lines as depressive disorder um, and other mood disorders. Great, thank you. Um, for an adult with autism and a seizure disorder, could supplementation for potential mitochondrial dysfunction be helpful, and would it be problematic to just try the mitrospectra? compound? Um, seizures, are, um, <clears throat> seizures are often associated with mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial disease. Um, one of the precautions um, in an individual who has seizure is that um, in taking L-carnitine, um, L-carnitine because it can have the effect of increasing um, the production of ATP, that can lead to increased um, activation of neurons. And, and so sometimes in individuals who have a seizure disorder, um, starting a high dose of L-carnitine um, abruptly can sometimes provoke a seizure. So in that setting, it is very important to use supplements under the supervision of a physician. Great, thank you. Um, 
this person asked, what was the NIH website again? Could you show that? Yes. It's um, the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements. And if, if you Google that, those words, it'll bring you to the correct website. Great. Um, next question. Do you know if there are any professionals in Vancouver, Canada doing research in this area? Um, you know, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of that. Um, there are, well, one way, um, another resource online that might help you, help guide you is um, a website called PubMed. P-U-B-M-E-D dot org. And that um, is a resource wh where you can search for published medical and scientific research articles. So if you type in their, um, in the, their search field, bipolar disorder mitochondria or bipolar disorder metabolism, um, it will bring up a lot of uh, the uh, research articles that have been published in this area. And what you can do on each um, research abstract, it will sh show you the authors of the study and what institutions they're affiliated with. So that may be a place to start. Great, thank you. Where can you find, I suppose, find a list of supplements for specifically bipolar disorder? Um, I think the best resource is the, res the review article that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, that it lists the supplements that, you know, based on the current research literature, seem to have seem to be most promising for bipolar disorder. Um, now, it I don't think that the research article discusses um, it does list what those supplements are, but I don't think that it discusses dosages. Um, there are, a, a, you know, many of the companies that. Um, Many of the more reputable national companies that sell these do provide guidelines for adult dosing, and it's so it's the dosage that's provided on the packaging. So there are some, you know, there is some information about dosing provided by the supplement companies themselves. Um, but for the for the list, I think that that research article is the best resource. Great, thank you. And again, certainly, you know, discussing dosing with your physician. Yes, excellent. Um, next question, do you have any recommendations for an eight-year-old girl who is diagnosed with ADHD, bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder? Hmm. Um, you know, my, my first recommendation is that um, there needs to be very, very thorough uh, neurological and metabolic testing. Um, when when a child presents very young with so many different neuropsychiatric symptoms, it is a red flag that there's something, um, you know, something biological that's very disrupted. And even though our tests are imperfect, um, doing them can be quite revealing. And so there are genetic tests, there are biomedical tests, there's brain imaging, there's electroencephalography, um, there are different types of functional brain imaging tests like SPECT scans that may be helpful. So it's it's hard to say in more detail, not knowing more about the individual child, but um, I just think it's enormously important that these sorts of biological factors be explored in a lot of detail. And sometimes it takes, you know, it takes multiple tests. It may take some time to arrive at a better understanding or to even arrive at an answer. Um, but uh, it, I just think it's so important to do so. And we're, you know, we're a little bit limited by the fact that the physicians who study this this area and who, um, you know, who who have clinical practices that kind of bridge neurology, um, psychiatry, uh, metabolism, and sometimes even infection and immunology, that there aren't that many practitioners who focus is their practice in that way. So um, I think, you know, that's a real difficulty and hopefully that will change over time as we as we do more education. Um, but there are 
excellent resources like the book I mentioned, Brain on Fire, um, research articles that, with a little bit of um, with a little bit of work on the part of the individual or the parent, you can put together a packet. And if you do have an open-minded physician, you can bring some of these to them, and it it makes quite a compelling case. Um, and then, you know, I think that's how we we start to get uh, to the change that's so so needed. Great, thank you. The next question, would a person with PTSD risk activation of symptoms with supplementation, such as neuronal excitation in the case of eye carnitine with seizures? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, so supplements, there's, there's so many different supplements and vitamins, and they they act in many different ways. Some are, are very activating. Some tend to lead to hyperactivity or agitation um, or a heightened level of energy. And others are calming. Um, and so there are, for example, there are um, supplements that have a calming effect, can be good for anxiety or obsessive compulsive symptoms, and also have antioxidant properties. And then there are supplements with antioxidant properties but are more activating or can lead to difficulty sleeping. So that's a case where based on an individual, individual specific symptoms, you would, could put together a mitochondrial cocktail that um, was more tailored um, but still has the desired kind of antioxidant and mitochondrial effects. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, is there a strategy to deal with constipation for a ch child with autism? Yes, there are some wonderful strategies. Um, and in, in my experience, constipation can often be handled um, very effectively through some diet, lifestyle, and supplements without having to resort to medications. Um, so. There's a lot of research and many hundreds of studies now in autism showing that there's disturbance to the microbiome, which is the microbial composition, um, including the bacterial composition of the gastrointestinal tract. And um, there are researchers at universities now doing studies to look at whether um, altering that uh, microbial composition of the gut through the use of probiotics can be helpful. And there's some very promising early findings in animals, in animal models of autism. Um, and probiotics are used very widely in children with autism. Um, probiotics, uh, prebiotics, so prebiotics are different from probiotics, but what prebiotics do, they're, they're compounds that you also ingest through the mouth, and they help to foster a more healthy microbial um, bacterial comp flora to the gut. So. Um, in terms of an approach to constipation, um, things to consider would be probiotics, prebiotics, um, forms of soluble fiber, and um, certainly taking steps to increase um, fluid consumption, so improve hydration through the diet, and to expand the diet to include more variety, uh, more fresh organic fruits and vegetables that have high fiber content um, and to try to reduce intake of foods that might um, exacerbate inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. So sometimes uh, food allergy or food sensitivity testing can be helpful. Great, thank you. The next question, if bipolar disorder is treated with valpro acid as a mood stabilizer, and this is men mentioned as a toxin. Does this research suggest this is harmful, or do studies need to be used to determine this? Valproic acid is a medication that's been around for a very long time and still used very widely. Um, one reason being that it's, it's really effective for a range of symptoms from seizures to uh, bipolar disorder to migraine headaches um, and many others. So um, as a resource that could potentially help patients' symptoms, it's an important one to use and to keep in mind. Um, one of the effects valproic acid can have is to um, deplete levels of carnitine in the body. 
So any individual who's taking valproic acid should have their carnitine level checked in the blood. And if it's low, um, it should be supplemented. Um, valproic acid can be used safely in those with mitochondrial dysfunction, but it just has to be done carefully. Um, carnitine should be supplemented along, along with it. And, um, you know, and symptoms of mitochondrial dysfunctioning, uh, worsening of mitochondrial dysfunction should also be monitored. So things like fatigue, muscle weakness, um, any uh, change in the function of the liver or an increase in liver enzymes or a compound called ammonia in the blood, um, those could all be signs that valproic acid is maybe causing um, some harm and then uh, you know, potentially other medications could be considered. But um, I do want to just make the fact that they'll make make the point that valproic acid is a good medication on so many levels, and it can be used safely even in those with mitochondrial dysfunction if the right steps are taken. Great, thank you. Um, next question: Does rapid cycling bipolar have the same likely likely causes um, and or recommendations? Um. In my view, um, my answer would be yes. So I think that there's a whole range of different ways that symptoms can present within bipolar disorder and within neuropsychiatric disorders more generally. Um, and uh, we know that mitochondrial dysfunction can present with lots and lots of different symptoms. So, so my answer to that would be yes. Great, thank you. Um, can delusions be helped? The supplements? Uh, I don't think we know we know the answer to that from you know from the point of view of the research literature. Um, but I, I would say certainly knowing that um, problems with mitochondrial function can lead to impairment of neuronal function in any part of the brain, and that uh, that includes the parts of the brain that might lead to delusions or hallucinations. Um, I would say that the theoretical potential is certainly there, um, but we don't have the scientific studies to support that yet. Great, thank you. One last question. Um, first, there's a comment that uh, the presentation was absolutely amazing and so much food for thought. Thank you for all the research you've done and for this helpful information. Their question is, do you have any information on organic hemp seed powder as a source of protein in the diet, and do you ever treat adult patients? Um, I do treat adult patients. I, d I don't, I'm not that familiar with, um, with hemp seed. So, um, gosh, I wish I could provide a better answer for that, um, but I do, you know, I can say there has been a lot of interest more recently and more research being put into um, marijuana and components of cannabis. Um, it's the early research suggests that there are some components of cannabis that are enormously effective for seizure control, um, for a, a, a wide range of neuropsychiatric symptoms. And, um, you know, that is very promising. So, um, I think that's a, an area of, of research to keep an eye on because there's great potential for that natural source, you know, that herb, um, cannabis, to be used in a very therapeutic and safe way. Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much for answering the many questions that you did. I know there were a few that were unanswered, and if you'd like to send me a direct email to dbrown at ibpf.org. I'd be happy to forward these last few questions to Dr. Go for answering. And I just want to remind you that this webinar has been recorded and will be archived and up on our website um, this afternoon to share or to review once again. So thank you, um, Dr. Go, so much for this presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me.